Welcome to the 196th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Robert Swartwood, author of The Serial Killer's Wife, The Calling, Man of Wax, and several other novels. The interview is coming up after just a brief message from ilus.com, the sponsor of this web, the sponsor of this podcast, and a new writing tool for writers. Check it out at ilus.com. Stay tuned for the interview. Hello, it's Paul Kemp, host of the App Guy podcast. Let me tell you about a tool that I'm involved with. It's called ILAS. It stands for I Love Your Stories. And it's a tool to help creative writers get out of the habit of writer's block. Now, don't just take my word for it. Bloomberg and The Next Web have both written about this. And a lot of people are giving us awesome feedback. This is on Twitter. Jack says, I love, love, love the idea of what you've built. I can't wait to actually jump in. As a struggling writer, I really do need this. Heath Armstrong, a podcaster, says, dude, I love ILAS. So go and check out ILAS dot com i l y s dot com and if you go to forward slash p h you'll get a fifty percent discount as a listener to this podcast even though it's free for the first three thousand words so thank you very much for listening as ilus dot com and go and start writing something awesome today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Robert Swartwood, the USA Today bestselling author of The Serial Killer's Wife, The Calling, Man of Wax, and many other novels. Swartwood's latest novel, New Avalon, has just been released. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about New Avalon yet, how would you describe your new novel? Uh, compared to my other novels, it's more of a uh, quote-unquote literary novel, mostly just because it's harder to try to, you know, pigeonhole. Um, I mean, it, it, it does have aspects of, uh, on the surface, it's kind of a conspiracy theory novel, because there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But the, the, the novel really focuses more on the characters so much, as opposed to, I guess, the plot, as opposed to, you know, in my other novels, where it's more of a fast-paced plot, and... Um, you know, we we're striving to get from place from place A to place B. Here, it's more just kind of uh, focusing on one character throughout an entire year as as his life just has been changing. But there's a lot more going on too because I think that sounds boring. Sure, sure. Well, um, what led you to writing New Avalon? Do you remember the initial idea or impetus for the novel? So yeah, I mean, uh, I can talk about it. It's not really considered a spoiler alert. I don't really go. Okay. So long story short, um, years and years and years ago, I had this, uh, short story idea, uh, what I always kind of considered my New Yorker, uh, short story idea it was like, you know, the short story I was going to write and sell them to New Yorker because it was so great. And clearly that didn't happen, but basically it was this idea that, uh, Princess Diana had, um, had gotten cancer. And she was going to, you know, basically back, uh, back, you know, cancer, I think nowadays there's more hope for, for a cancer, you know, when people have cancer, it's not an immediate death, um, sentence, but back, you know, 20 years ago, it was a little bit different, you know, back then I think AIDS was a uh, much more, I don't want to say popular, but like the focus was more on trying to find a cure for AIDS as, a, you know, as opposed to a, a cure for cancer. So when people had cancer, there wasn't as much hope. So the idea was that uh, she had gotten cancer, and um, her uh, her boyfriend at the time, Dodi Alfade, had kind of convinced her that you know instead of instead of withering away and dying in front of the entire world, you know that would really affect a lot of people in a really negative way. So they kind of, well, I guess you know faking her death is kind of a negative way too, but it was more of immediate and sudden as opposed to just watching her, you know, withering away, you know, throughout the years. So, so, um, basically she, uh, faked her death with, uh, Dodie Alfade and, uh, went to this, uh, hid away in this small, uh, Northern Pennsylvania town called New Avalon. And, uh, the story's narrator was kind of a young man who had walked away from his life uh, either by duty or what he kind of considered maybe destiny in terms of protecting her. So kind of as her driver slash bodyguard. And it was only supposed to be for a couple years because the cancer was supposed to be really coming on strong and uh, turned out to really kind of just stretch out. And so originally it was a short story that was maybe 15 you know, pages. It was kind of like basically just the beginning of a novel. And I kind of realized that 
there was so much more here. You know, I really wanted to explore more of the, 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 the uh, character. And the reason I said it's kind of a, somewhat of a spoiler alert, you know, saying up front that it's about uh, Diana is because I never in the book actually specifically say her name, even Dodie's name. It's always uh, mentioned as the woman or um, your friend because the novel's actually written in the second person. So I never really give their names, not because I'm trying to hide the fact that it's them, but I don't want the focus to be on them because the focus is really more on um, the main character who is uh, John Chambers. Great. Well, um, I, I know that, uh, I mean, so, so what was the process when you sat down and, and decided to expand this, this story to a novel? Was this something where you were, uh, where you were kind of looking for what you wanted to write next and you came back to that story? There was something about the story that always kind of stuck with me. I, I thought obviously it was just a really cool idea. You know, we kind of used the, uh, the starting out point of Princess Diana faking her death. Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of, the, you know, the, uh, the elevator pitch for the book, but obviously there's so much more. And originally when I think, I think I'd mentioned that the novel itself is written in the second person. When I mm -hmm. wrote the original short story, it was, I believe in first person. It's been so long now. It's been like 15, I think 15 years since I wrote that short story. So, um, so at some point there was just something about the, the voice of the narrator that just didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. And I would play around with it. And I've always been a fan of the second person narration, um, or I'm sorry, the second person, um, just kind of point of view. And, uh, the Stuart Nan's a prayer for the dying comes to mind. Um, you know, there's uh, bright lights, big city. Uh, it, it's, it's rare, but when it is done effectively, it is, I think amazing. So I've always been a fan of that. And, um, so, you know, I would experiment and try to like, I'm like, well, what if this story was told in second person? So I did that for the short story. And then that's kind of when I realized I wanted to expand it. And then it became almost sort of a, uh, I don't even want to say it, kind of like I asked myself, could I write a story in se or a, a novel in second person? Because it's very, very difficult. And... Um, I was basically told I was at a workshop one time and there was a big, uh, basically New York times bestselling author I was speaking with. And somehow it got mentioned that I was trying to write a person, uh, novel in the second person. And he basically said, you can't do that. And I'm not <laughs> even sure if he meant I personally couldn't do that or you as in general, like, right, you know, right. it just cannot be done. And from that, it became a challenge to proving that I can. And fortunately so far, a lot of the feedback from people who have read the novel so far yeah, they notice that's in second person, but it it doesn't detract from the story. I mean, it's, a few people might find it distracting, right? But on the most part, a lot of people seem to just really get lost in the story themselves, and they kind of, um, at the time, my agent, uh, because we had shopped the the, the book around, and um, uh, my agent at the time said, you know, at first, like the first page, obviously was a little bit distracting for him because second person is very very rare. I mean, you know, books are usually either first person or third person, but you know, he said very soon, he kind of forgot it was even in second person. He just, you know, got lost in the story. And that was my ultimate goal. And I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, if that's kind of what readers are able to take away from it, then I've hopefully succeeded. <laughs> that's great. Well, I, I know that you um, pioneered the concept of hint fiction and you edited a, a collection, hint fiction, an anthology of stories in 25 words or fewer uh, what, what led you to writing such micro stories and then editing this anthology? So I've always been a fan of the uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, short story. Well, not short story. It was the six word story for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And I just always loved the, the, the concept of telling a story in as few words as possible. And I forget what really started it for me, but at some point, um, there was, I think I, I'm, I think I was for a while, I was just kind of like publishing like really, really short fiction online and like a lot of like online journals. And I just started experimenting with these really, really short stories, which are basically maybe a sentence or two long. And in fact, I think even uh, one online journal, uh, Monkey Bicycle, they occasionally publish these one, one word stories. And so, um, you know, I, I wrote a, uh, several of those and, um, at some point, I think it was uh, Everyday Fiction, they have a writing blog called Flash Fiction Chronicles, and they were looking for submissions. And 
I don't know. I, for some reason, I came up with this idea of writing an essay about these really short stories. And as a joke, I said, you know, everybody, we, we basically like to label everything, you know, in, in publishing. That's why really there's, I think, genre. I, I personally don't think there should be a genre. I think a book should be a book. But basically, you know, publishers, booksellers, they need to kind of place them in certain categories. So we have genres. And the same thing with, uh, with short stories. You know, we have short stories. We have flash fiction. We have sudden fiction. We have micro fiction. I personally think it's all very silly. And so, again, as a joke, I said, well, let's, you know, what should we call these really, really short stories? Well, let's call them hint fiction because what they're essentially doing is hinting at a larger story. Uh, because obviously with the Hemingway story for sale, baby shoes never worn, there is so much more going on than what those six words, you know, show on the page. Um, and so, again, it started really, I was just kind of being facetious. And I had at the time, said I was going to do a little uh, contest at my blog. Um, I mentioned Stuart O'Nan before. He wrote A Prayer for the Dying. He's written several other great novels. I've been fortunate enough to know him for several years. So I asked him if he would be a judge for uh, a little contest. And he's like, sure, it sounds fun. Well, as things oftentimes happen on the internet, word like spread like wildfire. And the second day of the contest, uh, Norton, W.W. W. Norton, had uh, contacted me and my agent about putting together uh, the little anthology of these stories. So uh, it really was one of those things that I think had I come up with this idea and try to approach publishers with putting together a, a collection <laughs> of these stories. They would have, you know, they would have just slam the door on my face. But uh, it just, you know, the way things happen, um, it just really worked out. And so when the opportunity came to do this anthology, I mean, I'll, of course, I was going to take it as very, very seriously. I, um, for people who have read the anthology, uh, the, the placement of the stories, you know, they aren't random. That I place them in certain order so that the one story oftentimes would lead into the, to the next story. And, uh, you know, it's split up into three categories. And the, I mean, so like there was a lot of thought and, you know, for the most part, I think it really was very successful. I know colleges and schools still, you know, use it in their classes to teach. Um, oftentimes I'm asked if there's ever going to be another anthology as of right now, uh, there are no plans for it. And I honestly don't think I would want to just because I feel that if I do another anthology, it's just going to be a copy of this, the, the first anthology. Um, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we could find a lot of more great stories, but ultimately I think the anthology as it is, it serves its purpose, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. So are you still writing hint fiction yourself? You know, I, I would love to, but, um, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult. And, um, I don't know. I find it's easier to write a, uh, a hundred thousand word novel than, than it is to try to come up with, with a really good hit of fiction. Cause obviously you, you know, I mean, anybody can just write, um, 25 words and call it a story. But for me and for the hit fiction pieces that I had done before, it was always important to, you know, make something that was, that would stick with you. That would just, um, that would not be, you know, you read it and then you forget about it. So try to find, I, and I always kind of, think that a story should be as long as it needs to be so recently the stories that i have been telling have been longer stories than 25 not that i never plan to go back there i would love to at some point but as of right now nothing has really inspired me to um to uh to do that however i i do have one uh hint fiction story that i'm not even sure is considered a hint fiction story <laughs> um that sometimes when i uh when i when i sign you know uh when I sign copies of Hint Fiction, um, if I'm at schools or wherever else, uh, sometimes I'll include, which is called uh, Abridgment. And the story is just two words. It's the end. <laughs> and uh, and again, I'm like, yeah, I'm not really sure. Is that really considered? It's more maybe a commentary on different things than so much of a story. And that's kind of where the gray area falls into. I know a lot of people like to argue like, oh, those aren't really stories. And that was the great discussion that kind of arose from having the anthology about what what is a story what constitutes a story you know i mean if we hey you know because placing word limits on on our writing you know is is that a good thing is that a bad thing you know so it's it's kind of um you know it kind of just made people hopefully think more about that and again that was you know 
ultimately the goal of just kind of creating that conversation, which I forget who the author is. Um, but I know that there is a story called the ghost and it's just a blank page. <laughs> and I forget who the author is. It's, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a much older author. I, I, I don't even believe that, that, that they're still alive anymore, but, um, that's kind of considered a famous story too. Yes. Yes. And again, I mean, is that a story? I mean, there's a lot more going on. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I know that you have self-published many of your novels as eBooks. Why did you decide to self-publish? So around the time of Hint Fiction, well, okay, before Hint Fiction, I had written a lot of different novels. Um, I'd gone through two agents, and I had gotten very close with so many different, ty- with different novels, um, so much so that I think for one novel, uh, apparently a senior editor at Doubleday had called my agent and said, you know, I love this book, but... I just don't think it's right for double day. So it seemed that there's always that was going on. And that seems, I mean, that happens a lot with the different books. Um, there's only so many publishers out there. There's only so many books that they can take that a lot of good books just don't get published uh, for one reason or another. Uh, oftentimes just because back in the day, I think uh, editors had more power. I think nowadays uh, the marketing department, has a lot more power where the marketing department can say, okay, you know, we can probably sell X amount of uh, copies of this book where before it was like, well, let's take a chance on it. You know, they don't really want to take too many chances on books nowadays. So, you know, um, I had a lot of books basically in um, a, you know, quote unquote digital um, uh, drawer. So uh, when digital publishing started coming about, you know, I had, you know, I had seen other writers doing it and I had, I just think I had, uh, I had self-published maybe, I think it was a novella or a short story at the time. And I thought, yeah, you know, this is kind of cool. Um, but then, you know, the Hint Fiction anthology came out and I believe it came out in November and um, we had done a little mini tour where I'd gone to LA and New York to, with some of the contributors and we had been, I think, uh, McNally Jackson in New York and Romans in uh, LA and uh, a couple months later, I was back in New York for a reading, and I had swung by uh, McNally Jackson. Cause, you know, we had just had this reading there, and I was looking for this hint fiction anthology, and I realized it's not here. And I'm like, holy crap! It's only been like a couple months, and it really kind of hit me. You know, I mean, that, that, that's just the business of book selling. You know, there's only a finite number of spaces on a shelf. Bo- uh, books are coming out every month. And I'm, I'm sorry, not every month, every week. And um, basically, you know, the shelf life of a book is not very long. So I thought to myself, well, ultimately, when a book kind of is no longer found in bookstores, where do people go to buy these books? They're going online. You know, they're mostly going to Amazon. And it, I, I don't know, for some reason, I just kind of started thinking of the long term you know, about yeah. like, you know, when a book goes out of print or we, especially with digital, I mean, you know, the out of print doesn't really exist so much anymore. So, um, at the time I had, uh, my novel, the circular's wife, you know, I had talked to my agent. I said, do you mind, um, quite honestly, my agent at the time, uh, he's no longer my agent in retrospect because <laughs> he at that time, I didn't think he, he could really, you know, sell the circular's wife. He's like, you know, the, the thriller market is very, um, you know, he thought he could get very like minimal money for it. Right. So I'm like, well, like, like, you know, let's see if I can self publish and see what happens. He's like, oh, sure. So I started doing that and just was having a lot of success with it. I mean, that, that's a novel that he thought he couldn't sell. And you know, that one that is actually a USA Today bestseller. Um, it's my best selling novel so far. So, um, I don't know. I just started having so much success with it that it, I just haven't stopped. I'm not that I'm opposed to selling a book um, to a, to a, a traditional publisher. Just at the same time, I know what's possible on my end. You know, sure. I, I know what can be done, and I don't know. It, it, a lot of times, I think writers have to become more business minded. They have to understand what the industry is like. They have to understand, you know, writing. It's great, but at the same time, it's a job. You know, we it, it's a business. So. For me, um, and maybe it was because I had the anthology come out through Norton. Maybe, you know, maybe I got, got the whole thing out of my system. Like, oh, you know, I, I had a book in a bookstore. You know, you know. Now I think about it, and it's like, okay, big deal. But at the time, it was, you know, it was very, very exciting. And maybe had I not had that before, I would have been um, more inclined to try to sell a book. But now it's kind of at the point where, you know, when I'm working on a book, it doesn't even cross my mind to try to <laughs> to uh, to uh, send it to a publisher or anything. Um, yeah, it's just really weird. I was having a discussion with the writer the other day and this 
so I had this friend of mine who is a New York Times bestseller. He's gotten a lot of his backlist back, and I was having a discussion with him about just um, just how much the industry has changed. And he currently has some novels that he's working on, and basically are complete. And he's still debating with himself: does you know, does he want to self publish it, or does he want to try to have his agent sell it to a publisher? And it it's crazy how the industry has just shifted so much that that becomes an option where before there. There was no option. You basically, you know, you wanted to get to readers. How to get to readers? You got to go in bookstores. Well, how do you do that? You got to go through a publisher. You know, I mean, there's a whole process. And now, and now there's, you know, different options. Now, is that a ne- necessarily a good thing? Um, I mean, you know, granted, yeah, there are. When it comes to self-publishing, I always say just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. Um, mostly because you know I could go home and I could just self-publish anything, but I'm not going to because I know it's not ready. Um, going back to New Avalon, I mean, I, I basically put that novel away just because it I, I knew it needed a lot more work, and basically it did. I had to add a whole new chapter toward the end um, to really make it complete. So, you know, I could have probably self-published it years ago, but I just. You know, and I and I have other novels that I probably could theoretically just go home and self-publish tonight, but I'm not going to, because um, I want them to be as best as they can be, and and that goes back to the whole business aspect where, as writers, you know, we are we are a brand, and we want to make sure that when readers um, encounter our work, they you know they are not disappointed, you know, they, uh, you know, so that when they see our names, they just completely dismiss us. You know, we want to get to the point when they see our names, they're going to be like, Oh, they have a new book out. I want to get that. I want to read that. Um, sure. So, I mean, that, that's the ultimate goal, obviously. I mean, in terms of what you just said, I'm just curious, do you, do you work with any um, outside editors uh, at this point, um, given that you are self-publishing? Oh yeah. Um, I, actually, <laughs> who I have is uh, my old high school English teacher who's now <laughs> retired. Uh, but he tears my stuff apart. I mean, he's been teaching English for, I mean, he taught it for, Oh God, I don't know, 20, 30 years. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we think of editors in New York, you know, I think a lot of people like think of like, uh, you know, there's, there's very few George Pimpletons anymore. Um, a lot of them are just, you know, people who were interns and then they became, you know, readers and they kind of worked their ways up to being editors. I mean, obviously, you know, they know what they're doing, but then they're, but a lot of times, I mean, and I, and I know writer friends of mine who had been traditionally published. A lot of times they would, they would complain that, you know, they weren't really getting edited. You know, there was getting a very kind of just surface editing, mm-hmm. you know, checking for, you know, typos or other stuff, but nothing that was really deep down. And, and so, um, and so like, yeah, my high school teacher, I mean, I mean, he will, he will tear stuff apart, you know, he will have long discussions about, you know, motivations for characters or how, you know, this doesn't really make sense. You know what I mean? So there is a lot, a lot of work that goes in there. And then on top of that, um, you know, I, I, I hire a graphic designer. Um, I, I work with several different graphic designers for the, uh, the cover arts, um, and the design and also, a a, 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 a proofreader. So before it even, you know, is out to people, you know, I, I make sure somebody else goes through and just checks it for all kind of like the bumps and warts. Uh, and even that sometimes, you know, maybe sometimes, it, you know, it, it, it will come back and there might still be like, you know, a, a, a typo here and there. But again, that even happens with, you know, I've read some books from major publishers and I've found typos. Um, it happens. Um, what's funny is I had one book that I sold a lot of copies of. And then like years later, I got uh, someone brought to my attention that. Uh, instead of dairy farm, it was diary farm. <laughs> but I'm like, wow, this is <laughs> after all this time, this is yeah. the first time someone's pointed out. So, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, basically get, and again, going back to the whole idea about being a business and being a publisher, um, you know, yeah. Hiring the people to do different things. Um, in terms of formatting, I've, I did, I do my own over a lot of trial and error. In fact, I even kind of, uh, people hire me to even do formatting for them occasionally. Uh, because I've gotten to the point now, you know, with uh, like Adobe and design and everything else that I'm just, I'm very confident I know, and I know what I'm doing that I can do it pretty quickly. Um, uh, and also something else that I had r- begun to understand closer to uh, after, you know, Hint Fiction and when I started self-publishing is that um, outsourcing such as like editing and graphic design and um, and uh, and proofreading is a lot of times publishers just do that. I mean, it's just a lot of times, you know, they'll outsource. In fact, even the hint fiction anthology, you know, the, uh, I believe the people that did the interior design, they weren't really at Norton. You know, right, the right. publisher paid them to mm-hmm. design the book. 
So oftentimes, you know, I kind of feel, you know, in the same way, you know, even if I didn't design my own stuff, I could easily hire somebody. So it's like, you know, they're, they're basically, you know, base, uh, flat payments once and done, once I recoup the, those, uh, those costs, you know, basically everything is pure profit. And the great thing about digital uh, publishing is that, that there's almost no overhead. I mean, if, if I was just doing, you know, just paperbacks, there is no way I could uh, like even attempt to have a career because there's no distribution. But in terms of eBooks, you know, the distribution is the same as say James Patterson or Dean Koontz. Like my book has, you know, the same, you know, it's just there. You could sell the same amount of copies. It, obviously they don't, but I wish they did. But, uh, you know, as opposed to at a bookstore where, you know, I might have, you know, the Hidden Fiction Anthology uh, comes out, there's like two copies on the shelf. Stephen King has 20 copies, you know? Right. So, right. so I mean, again, the, the, just the business aspect. Sure. So what advice would you have for uh, someone who's listening, who's an aspiring writer and would one day want to have their own stories or novels published, either self-publishing or traditional publisher? Uh, basically just, um, just write, I just, it sounds so cheesy, but basically like write, <laughs> write your story, you know, like, like don't try to like imitate, you know, some other book that is popular right now, you know, like try to write the story that you want to write. Uh, because I think that way, you know, you're obviously going to be more invested because I mean, we've all read sto- uh, books where we can tell, you know, the author is just phoning it in. And then we've read books where we can tell that an author is really engaged and they really have passion about, you know, the subject matter and the characters and just the story in general. Um, also I think, uh, you know, obviously read a lot, write a lot. Um, even if I think if it's like, you know, just sit, sitting down for like just a couple minutes every day, I know it's hard. I mean, I, I find it hard for myself. I don't know why. Like I love writing, but it's like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> it is, it is, it is just, I don't know. Cause it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just, there, 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 there's something about it. And I know I've had discussion with a lot of writers. I'm sure you have too, where it's just, it's not, you know, it's not a, it's not as easy as everyone likes to think, you know, you, you, you tell somebody you're a writer and they're like, Oh yeah, you know, I'm thinking about writing a book. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> well, good luck with that. I mean, yeah. Um, and in terms of, you know, in terms of self, either self or traditional, I, I try not to get involved in the whole back and forth that like right. kind of goes on where it's like, Oh, you have to do this. You have to do this. You know, I kind of feel do, you know, do what you do what you want to do. You know, if you want to be traditionally published, okay, we'll shoot for that. If you want to be self-published, you know, do that, but be aware of the two options, you know, kind of like know all the pros and cons either way and just kind of make an educated, you know, um, d- decision then. Um, yeah. Like, you know, don't be pressured to do one or the other, you know, just do what you feel is right. And I think, you know, ultimately you'll be happy with that. That's great. Well, are there novels or nonfiction books that you've read in the last year or two that made an impact on you and that you would recommend? Novels or nonfiction? Oh, man. Um, I recently got done listening to the uh, Steve Jobs uh, biography, uh, which was like, I think, like 23 hours long on audio, but it was <laughs> crazy. Uh, and that was really fascinating. Um, just kind of, you know, I, you know, I kind of knew a lot about him already, but there was still just a lot going on there. And despite the fact that it's a really long book, just how much he was involved with. Like I kind of, I kind of knew that he was involved with Pixar, but not to the extent that it, it, he really was. I mean, he really kind of helped build Pixar to what it is today. And, um, you know, in, in addition to Apple and everything else, um, other nonfiction, I read, uh, the Glenn Greenwald book, uh, no place to hide the one about, uh, Edward Snowden. That was a really fascinating read. Um, in terms of novels though, <laughs> I've read so many good ones, but off the top of my head, I'm trying to think what, uh, <laughs> what are some really good novels I just recently read. Uh, a while back, I read uh, Max Berry's uh, Lexicon, mm-hmm. which I thought was a really great, uh, really great, um, it really it's a thriller. Um, and it's really hard to explain, but basically just these, these people who have this power to use these words to cause people to do things like it's, I probably sound like an, an idiot trying to explain it right now, but it's just, it's a really, really good book. I really enjoyed that one a lot. Um, That's great. Yeah. Well, well, if, if people are interested in learning more about you and the books that you've written, where can people find you online? Basically any of the, uh, the platforms, um, you know, Amazon, Barnes Noble, iTunes, uh, Kobo, Google play. Um, yeah, everywhere. Right. And even on the website, which is just robertswartwood.com. 
Great. And I'll have links to, to that in the show notes as well. Well, again, we've been speaking with Robert Swartwood, author of New Avalon. New Avalon is available now as an ebook on all the major ebook stores. So go grab a copy. And Robert, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man. The stockings are hung and the shopping has begun. This holiday season, shop Cincinnati favorite gift cards at Kroger. Grab a gift card to La Rosa's and enjoy a warm slice of pizza. Or snag a gift card to Grater's and treat yourself to something sweet. Whoever you're shopping for, you'll earn four times fuel points on Cincinnati favorite gift cards. Head over to giftcards.kroger.com slash Cincinnati dash favorites to complete your shopping list and support our local businesses. Available in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Louisville markets only. Restrictions apply. See website for details.